This episode is proudly supported by the new Capital Food Market Canberra, where you can explore the very best producers, artisans, fresh food providors, and hospitality venues of the region. Here's Bede Wright from Market Meat. It looks great. Everything is looking so high end. And I think everybody that I've spoken to in the markets that has a stall, it, that's what we want. We've always had this vision of how our business should be and the kind of operation we want, the kind of clientele we want. And I think finally, the two sides of that are going to mesh. And it's just a really inviting place. For more information, go to capitalfoodmarket.com.au or visit the markets and feed your curiosity. It's the Deep in the Weeds Podcast Network Christmas episode. I'm Anthony Huckstep, and today I'm joined by the entire crew of the network. Danny Vallant, how are you? I am excellent. So excited to be at this time of the year. Shante Whale, you're here too. Thrilled to be here, and I can't believe we made it through. And big John Sussman. How are you, mate? Great, Huck. You're looking very uh, Father Christmassy. It's, uh, it's good to see you, finally. I know. I've, I think I've just morphed into Father Christmas. I've certainly got the belly for it and unfortunately the, the beard now as well. Uh, how, how's everyone been? What's the year been like for you? Oh, look, it's been, it's been a really big year. I think it's been a year of many stories to tell. I think the, the thing that's probably top of my mind is I've taken my first post-COVID overseas trip, just been to Thailand for a couple of weeks, uh, which has been amazing. So, yeah, really excited to remind myself that I love food adventures. Uh, I think I ate my body weight both in mango sticky rice and in noodles. Uh, And, yeah, I'm feeling really energised for the silly season and, um, yeah, looking forward to a pretty chill summer and a big 2024. But we can get into all of that. John, you spent most of the year overseas. What's been sort of the highlights for you while you've been traveling? Look, I was in fact, funny enough, in 2018, I had 168 flights and this year I've had a, only 104. So um, it's, it, you know, a, a, but look, it, it's just reminded, it, it, it's definitely reminded me how airline travel absolutely sucks. But um, it's also reminded me, and it was going to be, for one of my highlights or surprises of the year, but I may as well talk about it now, is that how such amazing value is represented in hospitality here in Australia in terms of the quality, in terms of the ingredients, in terms of the final finished product. Um, I think we should be really excited about you know the standard that we're, we've, uh, we've got here in Australia and our hospitality venues across the board. It's, it's so exciting. Shante, you had a big change this year and career shift and lots of things happening. What's it been like for you? Yeah, a bit of everything. I, it's It's been so nice to kind of take it down a notch, spend a bit of time home. But at the same time, I did a fair bit of travel too. So just trying to find a balance and that quest for always a bit of balance is uh, it's an ongoing journey, isn't it? <laughs> Well, I think the furthest I travelled to was Blacktown in Sydney this year. Um, it's probably the least I've travelled. I uh, used to be on planes all the time, but, um, you know, it's been more of a sort of a family-centric sort of year and um, it's been nice to be part of what's emerging in Canberra as well as a lot of exciting things happening here. And I had a bit of fun in, in Sydney too, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to um, soon. What's, what's, what's everyone sort of feeling like about the last year and sort of, you know, where things are in regards to food. Danny, you're very involved in sort of the food media and what's going on. What's the sentiment out there? Yeah, I'm doing two restaurant columns, two weekly columns now. So one in Good Weekend on the Saturday and one in the Sunday Age on the Sunday. So that requires a lot of eating out as well as reviewing for the Good Food Guide. Um, mostly I've been eating in Victoria, uh, but have certainly yeah found my way uh, up and down the East Coast a bit. Um, and look, I think, you know, we've heard in the podcast, it's been a pretty challenging year for a lot of people, you know, staffing still an issue, but I think the big one for people is costs. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting what John says about the value that's offered here. And I, I have to agree, I think it's incredible. Uh, but I think people are 
you know, really shaving the margins to provide that value. So, it, you know, we, we know because we chat to so many people in the industry that, that it's pretty tough. But from a consumer side, I think, you know, quality is really high. It's a very competitive space. Um, I think people are being creative in ways that you don't necessarily see on the plate with bells and whistles, but creative in how they manage their menus, manage their rosters, manage their kitchens. And, you know, as someone who's a real watcher of the industry, as well as someone that dines out, I, I really appreciate the extraordinary creativity and effort that goes into all of that. Um, I think the challenge is probably the dining public also getting on board with that and, and realising that if we want restaurants to be, you know, part of our culture, the culture of our cities and our towns and our regional areas, that it, there's another layer of appreciation to, to bring to the picture. So, yeah, I, I wonder how far that's percolated and what will happen over the, mm. the coming months and years in, in, in that arena. Shanta, you've been travelling, you mentioned overseas, but also bouncing around Australia a lot more than previously. You were working at, at Key. Um, what, what have you sort of been seeing out there? What's been exciting you around Australia? Oh, man, I, I just spent a bit of time in Gippsland and I was just uh, ready to pack my bags almost and move out there simply for the dairy. I mean, cheese has got me every time, but I think there's, like you guys said, Australian hospitality is very natural. Even loving going overseas, being in Italy, thrilled to be there, but I was so also thrilled to return home. And I think it's got to do with our natural, easygoing, laid-back style, but also hospitality is very natural for us too. So I'm so proud of Australia and I there's so many places that I haven't explored yet. And so it's it's endless. It's really cool. It's an interesting period of time, you know, with social media and the importance that that plays with sort of restaurants, with their marketing, but also the impact it has on consumers and their decision making. And I'm not convinced that the right decisions are always made as because that's such a channel to find out new restaurants um, compared to what it used to be. Um, and it's sort of leaving the old guard behind a little bit and changing the shape of the industry a little bit in sort of who's important and who's not. Um, is that something that you guys are witnessing and seeing that sort of weird dynamic going on? Well, Huck, I'll, I might jump in here a bit actually, being the oldest and greatest Luddite of the group. Um, I, I honestly think that pop is beginning to eat itself and that there is a there is a, an emerging renaissance of appreciation of old-fashioned recommendations from people you trust and, and know. And it'll be interesting to get Danny's take on this as a professional food journalist. But, I mean, I'm less and less inclined to just jump on the on the social media bandwagon I, and I'm beginning to think that, you know, having a lot of followers or a lot of likes is by, like being rich in Monopoly and it kind of doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily resonate or, or reflect in terms of the actual enjoyment, particularly I think if you've got a, a level of confidence in your own ability to, to understand what represents good, better, best, both on the plate, in the service and in the venue. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually paying less and less attention to social media than, than I probably have over the last seven or eight years. And I'm less inclined to you know fall just hook, line and sinker for for what is being represented up there. So I think that there's, you know, it's finding its place. I'm, a re I'm really interested to see where social media sits and it'd be really interesting to hear from you guys as well. But just as a, as a you know, mud consumer that does eat out, you know, sort of five days a week, I think there's a, there is a genuineness coming back into the market that is really exciting and that integrity um, based around, you know, having to perform for who's in the seat in the restaurant rather than having to perform of who's watching on social media. Is, is, is a pretty exciting transformation from where I sit. Uh, I don't know. I think there's room for all of it. I think you can't deny trends and custom that's driven by TikTok particularly, but also Instagram. I mean, you can walk through the city of Melbourne and see queues, you know, outside the door and going around the corner and, uh yeah, there's, there's nothing that explains that but social media. Whether those people are still lining up the next week um, or whether they've, you know, flocked to the, to the latest, you know, where the algorithm sent them next is another question. Mm. And whether those venues are actually the best venues to really go to. And, and after all, there are only so many, 
so many deep fried Mars bars in a bubble tea that you can actually consume. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe there's a world record um, attempt on that that we we don't know about yet. Um, I don't know. I think even the idea of best, you know, like what is it? it it's I think it's okay for that to mean different things to different people. But one thing I am noticing, you know, that actually combines those two things is the social media personal recommendation aggregators. So I'm thinking about uh, there's an app, World of Mouth, which is an international experts trusted guide to um, dining around the world. So it's... um, so it is that idea of personal recommendations, but they are aggregated and um, distributed via social media. So I think I think that's that's an interesting one. Even you know that Instagram account that keeps popping up for me, seconds, where you've just got people in the industry who are being asked rapid fire. You know what do they recommend? So it's combining that idea of trusted recommendations and social media. So I don't know. Maybe it's um. It, in a way, that sort of proves what you're saying, saying John. It's like pop is eating itself. But, um, you know, maybe some of the things it's eating are, are pretty tasty. <laughs> well, um, I've eaten some pretty tasty things this year. Um, I, I haven't been to many restaurants, but I've got kids that eat better than most adults. They're absolutely extraordinary. So we can't actually take them anywhere. And um, I pr- There's a new restaurant in Canberra called Such and Such, and it's by the guys from Pilot and... Um, it's just a relaxed wine bar style, but Mel Hanslow, he's just, he's just one of those, um, chefs that just knows how to bring flavor to the table without sort of showing off, you know, everything's simple. There's not too many elements, but it's just delicious, you know, absolutely delicious. And, um, you know, hats off to those guys. They're young. They're taking on a market that's evolving rapidly in Canberra. It's a really amazing sort of food scene here. And, you know, they're just knocking it out of the park. And it, um, what about you guys? Have you had some like cracking killer sort of best eats for the year? Yeah, definitely. I went and had an amazing um, lunch at Monopole. And it, what I loved about it was that it was actually like a release of back vintage wines from Crinterton, all of their Macvans and all of their Sauvignons they've ever made. But the chef actually tailored the menu for the wine. And I just think that that is such an amazing humility that that shows with a chef who probably, you know, has his own cuisine, but he's happy to like start from scratch to showcase what's going to work best with the wines. And that was just every dish was impeccable and then just in, even improved the, the ex- drinking experience. So hats off to Monopole for, for doing such a great job. John, what's been your favourite sort of eat of the year? Oh, look, I've had a few. I mean, I've probably my best seafood experience was after we'd been training some young Saudi fishermen on the Red Sea how to actually brain spike and gill bleed this tropical fish and look after them properly. And typically the cuisine of, of the coastal cuisine of the, the west coast of Saudi is heavily spiced, a lot of a lot of uh, yogurt marinade and and heavy frying or heavy grilling, and to enjoy a meal where we actually just filleted these icky jammed fish and these young fishermen that had never eaten raw fish before to see them eating sashimi was just such an experience, and it was just reminded reminded me of just how exciting seafood is when it's just really simply prepared and really fresh. And and then the other extreme would be sitting in Margaret and eating 14 different species of wild fish that are just simply grilled and present with a lick of olive oil. And, you know, it takes a fair degree of confidence and skill to be able to deliver something like that in such simplicity. I mean, the, the perfect swan with pike is the ultimate dive. And, and um, you know, I think that, that what, what Neil and the team are doing down there at Margaret is just at, at every level just exemplary for, for the category that I work in. I've had some great meals in Brisbane this year. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly eating in Melbourne, definitely quite a bit in Sydney, but I think Brisbane's really stood out for me as, uh, you know, you, you mentioned how well Canberra's coming on, Huck, but I think Brisbane is just racing and really exciting. So it was it was great to see Agnes being named the Gourmet Traveller Restaurant of the Year this year. I think it's so exciting to, you know, um, yeah, put a Queensland restaurant at, at, um, at the top of the tree like that. And having eaten there a few months ago, I just, just could not 
be gladder to see it getting the recognition that it deserves. You know, everything cooked over fire, brilliant wine service, uh, just really honest flavours um, and a beautiful room, like really atmospheric. Doesn't feel, I suppose when I think classic Queenslander, you're thinking bright, breezy, um, sunny, but this is like a moody room. And although you can sit out on the rooftop, which we did for dessert, and that was wonderful as well. Um <clears throat> A couple of other standouts in Brisbane for me have been short grain. We covered the opening of that um, with Martin Burtz on Dirty Linen and it was wonderful to hear from him about the development of that restaurant and then to be able to go and eat there was really exciting. So I think, you know, a lot of, as he calls it, you know, classic Marty dishes, so dishes that, you know, people might recognise from long grain over the years, but um, to see him return to his hometown and present them in a really cool kind of old factory space, very very exciting and um and some young restaurateurs coming through bar francine which is a, a brisbane wine bar in a little um cute little queenslander and mostly vegetable cooking but some really nice seafood there as well um and yeah just a really fun place just like kids having a go and just the enthusiasm that's coming through uh from both staff and people eating there was just uh just really winning. Uh, absolutely loved it. And, yeah, can't wait to go and eat in Brisbane again. I'm glad you mentioned Marty and Short Grain. In, in Canberra just recently, um, Becky that owns Zab, a Thai restaurant, uh, just recently opened Sen Nudes, which is a new Thai restaurant. And Canberra's lacking in Thai restaurants. I'm used to sort of living near Newtown in Sydney and, and indulging in all of the amazing Thai food there. And um, she's just cracking out some classic amazing Thai dishes and it's so good I've, I've I don't know if I've been as excited about an opening you know it's only you know twenty dollars a head or something but it's one of the best things that sort of happened and I, and I kind of feel like that sort of area of food you know where it's sort of you're not spending a lot of money but you're getting a massive bang for buck it's you know might, might be local um when I was I mentioned Blacktown at the top of the show and uh, I was in Sydney earlier this year and went to Gersha, which is an Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian restaurant in Blacktown. And it was phenomenal, you know, and um, basically got this huge plate with about 10 different curries on it, um, this huge bread, which I think is called injera. I probably pronounced it wrong, but um, – and you just sort of – wrap up the bread and mop it through the curries and the five-year-old twins were sort of trying to avoid the bits with chili in it and one of them got it and she was like ah it's spicy but it's delicious you know, <laughs> which that. was a, which was a great sentence but uh, she drank a glass of water and then got on with it but um i think they ate more than i did that day but my god you know you just sit around a table with 10 friends and and eat like that it's it's almost nothing better do you guys have some sort of you know, like a surprise packet that's not, you know, these sort of fancy restaurants that's, you know, your local cheap and cheerful. Talking about cost of living, like I, ca I can't believe this year that I've reassessed what's local in my area, just trying to kind of boycott the bigger brands, you know, and going like, who's selling local honey? Can I get eggs from anyone around here? Um, and I thought I did that during COVID, but even more so this year. But I hit up Flemington Markets, Paddy's Markets, Fresh Produce Markets once, twice a year. And if you go at the end of when they're kind of closing down, you get some crazy sales, you know, like 10 kilos of cucumbers for 50 cents, you know, and you're like, what the heck am I going to do with all these cucumbers? But I fed most of my street, made a heck of pickles and, you know, for what I got for $100, I was just amazed. So it's worth the drive to go up there. Shante, isn't it a peck of pickles? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> A heck of a peck of pickles. Um, I think my greatest cheap eat discovery was Miksha Food Truck, which is a Turkish kebab van in Campbellfield. So, you know, right on the out northern outskirts of Melbourne, you know, you, you're sort of almost um, on the way to Sydney and it's in a factory back block. Like there's just like, you know, jet ski repairers and building fabricators around there. And you, um, you like, surely this isn't the place. So then you come up on there's you know fairy light strung and just a yeah just a, like like an outdoor lot with some chairs and tables and these really really good um Turkish kebabs um, cooked by Ishmael Tosun in a van with his daughter uh he totally knows what he's doing he's you know he's 
worked in fine dining restaurants. Uh, but um, yeah, it's like kebabs are simple and kebabs are good and they're made with a lot of care, rigor, and yeah, just super satisfying. And, and you know, not only a great eating experience, but I think that my highest trafficking review this year. So I think not only are we keen on ha- eating those experiences and finding them, I think people are really keen on seeking them out as well and, and yeah, getting, getting – um, getting on that train. Everyone's looking for value, absolutely. But I think it's not just um, it's not just that you're not spending that much. It's like the experience is beyond. Like the story is is all there. Like, yeah, love it. John, you like to hit the local local restaurants when you're back in Australia. Have you, you got a favourite? Oh, look at – I mean, they're all pretty much favourites. I mean, I, I, I am sort of – yeah, definitely I think you've got to agree with with everyone that there is this sort of hunt for value but at the same time I'm sort of in the business of trying to make sure that we celebrate and support our catchers and growers um, and so whilst it's fantastic to sort of say that we can find a feed for 10 bucks we've also got to be recognising what it takes to actually put that produce on the table and um, you know at the moment one of the one of the issues in, in my industry is country of origin labelling in restaurants and the reality is that if we want to feed the kids for 10 bucks after school on a Tuesday night with fish, it's unlikely to be local um, and not necessarily should, should it be. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with celebrating. We live in a beautiful first world environment that, that it comes with those high costs of living. And therefore, you know, maybe we own Saturday night as a, as a producer nation and recognize that imports are an important part of the basket of food that we eat in this country. So, um, you know, to that to that point, I feel obliged to make sure that I'm supporting my local catchers and growers, and and so my average check, I would I guess, is probably higher than just being able to 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 look exclusively um, at that lower cost protein. So, um, you know, I I still think that you know when we compare it to you know ten euros per Giardot oyster in an oyster bar in Paris, that you know, being able to buy a dozen unopened oysters for twenty bucks and open them yourself represents extremely good value and there's a category that we've seen this incredible rise in in terms of the quality of the output of the farmers both here in New South Wales and around the country Um, you know I I tend to look at the value proposition rather than the price exclusively and I think that we're seeing some incredible value propositions particularly in the seafood world and particularly in Asian seafood using local seafood here in Australia Um, you know I mean the reality is that you can pay 90 bucks for a, a chili crab in Chinatown and the merchants probably paid 70 bucks for the crab. So, you know, that's insane value by comparison to what what a, a typical Western restaurant metric might look at at four times protein cost for the plate itself. So, yeah, I think it's, I think, you know, we do still have incredible value in the market here, whether, whether you're choosing to eat sashimi or whether you're choosing to, to eat a stir fry. And uh, I think, I certainly sort of find find value. I seek out value, that's for sure. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with paying, you know, sixty five dollars for a plate of fresh fish in a premium restaurant. That represents value if it's well sourced and cooked. I'm going to leap in with a little plug for our newsletter team because um, if anyone hasn't yet uh, subscribed to our newsletter, we will put a link in the show notes. But John, what I loved in our most recent one, um, apart from everything else, was your rundown on seafood that's great at, at the moment with, with definitely um, a lot of chat about what's offering incredible value. And I think, you know, as you always do, you know, pointing to alternative species uh, when, you know, something's not really rocking at the moment and what, yeah, what else, what else could you have on the plate? Um, I think that's always such useful information. I mean, that's definitely a conversation that I'd like to see us pursue in 2024 is to look outside the box in terms of where we seek out produce and how we actually encourage consumers as much as restaurateurs and to, to utilise some of the lesser known species or, or, or cuts even. On that note, what's everybody having for Christmas? What are we eating? Well, I normally do a porchetta with Christmas ham poached fish, poached prawns, and a bunch of salads. And it's normally like a peach and pistachio and mint salad or um, a pea, dill, iceberg, lemon sort of salad. Um, but I'm, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm going to mix it up a little bit this year. Uh, I think I might pull the porchetta out. Um, I think I might actually 
bake the ham, which I never do. Um, I'm always for sort of having the ham on the bone in the fridge sort of, you know, to slice at any sort of time. And I thought I might give that a bit of a go and uh, and roast it and um, present at that as the meat for Christmas. And I thought I'd not poach prawns this year and I thought I'd do something really daggy and uh, which suits me to a T and do garlic prawns because everyone loves it. I don't care what they say, what anyone says. Everyone loves garlic prawns if you smash them out of the, out of the park. Can't promise I can do that, but uh, I'm going to try and do that. You definitely can do that. I think a glazed ham is is a lovely idea and you can put the peach you're going to put in your salad and make a little peachy jam and put that. And now that we know that the girls can handle a bit of spice, you can put a bit of chilli flake in it as well. Is that, I normally do a glazed ham with a, a peach and mango chutney with some Szechuan pepper and it's really delicious. I've ordered a ham but it's only just like a little half ham because half my family's gone vego, which is um, very annoying. Um, (laughs) So you'll definitely be doing – but there's got to be a ham. Um, And I'm also going to make my famous Christmas strawberry gazpacho, which is a Portuguese spin on gazpacho um, with strawberries and capsicum and a little tomato and goat's cheese salad on the side. So that's a lovely entree that you can just pass around. Sounds great. I'll probably be diving into a selection of rock oysters um, and there are some beauties around at the moment and, you know, the poor old rock oyster farmers here on the East Coast have had a pretty torrid time of the last three summers with fires and floods, etc. So to see great rock oysters in fantastic condition, I'm certainly going to be spending the morning shucking. Oh, like Huck, I'll be having plenty of prawns as well because as we've been discussing, wild Australian prawns are as, you know, like in- representing incredibly good value for the quality that's around right now. Um, and you know what? Unfortunately, because of the, I mean, not for, unfortunately, fortunately, I'm also going to be having lobsters because lobsters that uh, we, we still don't, we still can't get back into the China market. So it's an absolute bonus for, for all of us here in, uh, in Australia. And Shante, I'm going to be guzzling a vat full of um, 23 Hunter Semion that I'm finding absolutely delicious, the latest releases that are just so, you know, bright and zesty and just perfect seafood wine. So yeah, I'm going all the way in Hunter Semion. And, um, and then I'll be ready for Boxing Day Test Hut. <laughs> well, I'm I'm actually just officially adding lobster to the uh, list for Christmas after John's comments. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And what are you going to be drinking, Shantae? Give us a give us a tipple tip for Christmas. Oh gosh, do you know what? That's the last thing that I've thought about. <laughs> I've, what? I've, I've just done. <laughs> I've done so much tasting and reviewing of wine lately. I'm probably going to have some tequila. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some really delicious, freshly squeezed margaritas. Um, but I will definitely, there'll be lots of wine there, that's for sure. There's too much wine in our household. Um, and I'll save some of the special bottles that I've been waiting to open with my family for sure. But I think my mum's doing rare roast beef this year. But I'm excited about sides more than anything else. So, like, we're going to do char grilled broccolini and um, tanata sauce, which I've just put on everything these days. And um, I've pickled more more pickles, pickled cherries and jalapenos and made a jam to put on a roast goat, goat's cheese. So, yeah, I'm excited about all the other bits and pieces. <laughs> 2023 was, uh, was a, it was a good year. We didn't have COVID threatening lockdowns and – um, you know, it was, it's been challenging as well, but um, we're pushing into 2024. Danny, what are you hoping to see? What are you expecting to see for the next year? Uh, what do I want? I mean, I definitely think we've seen smaller menus uh, in a lot of establishments. It just helps to control costs. But I think as a diner, I really love that. I think what I what I love the most is restaurants that are so clear of their project that they don't try to cover all the bases. They just um, are able to express who they are and what they're offering, you know, on a menu and then on the plate. Uh, so I'm looking forward to not having too much choice, just having a curate, curated experience. I think we, we did see that, you know, coming out of lockdowns with, with a lot of set menus. And I think a lot of people have eased off on that. 
but there's still something about that. You know, maybe you've got a few choices for entrees, mains and desserts rather than this big overwhelming cart. So that's something I'm looking forward to. And I guess, um, you know, tapping into what John's been saying, just um, – Look, really looking after producers, just really honouring the produce, um, you know, paying a fair price for it and then not being too scared to pass that on. I know that that's just always such a tricky equation. Um, but, yeah, I guess it's a, it's what I'm hoping to see is, um, yeah, that there's value and proper proper value put at every step of the supply chain and that consumers are, you know, willing and, of course, able to, you know, come to the party and, and support that. I've been part of uh, um, markets here in Canberra and the creation of it and um, it's just sort of opened and the second phase of it's opening in 2024. But one of the things I love about Canberra and what I think people who don't embrace fresh food markets sort of should get on board with is that how long produce lasts for when you buy it from farmers markets, from fish markets, from fresh food markets and the value in that sense, you know, sometimes you might pay a bit more and it's amazing quality, but it'll last longer in your fridge. So you probably won't throw it out. You know, I think a lot of food ends up in the crisper at the bottom and doesn't actually get used. Um, and, you know, as well as immersing yourself in sort of fresh food market and um, maybe sort of having a greater connection to where your food comes from, it, it also lasts longer in the fridge and you're doing a bit better for the environment as well. And I, I would love to see that happen more and more. It's a very mature market uh, for fresh food markets in Canberra. The the figures of the amount of people compared to population that go to markets is extraordinary. Um, I've, I've been lucky to sort of been privy to that information and I'd like to see that sort of more so like um, – because it's just – it's a great way to shop. It's a great way to cook. It's a great way to live. John, what are you um, seeing or hoping for in the next year? Uh, I'm really looking forward to, yeah, there being a, a, a genuine – sort of level of recognition for the value of, of Australian produce and uh, – but not, not you know, jingoistically saying that we can't, you know, use or, or enjoy imported product um, in, in the world of seafood, that is. But I think that very much, you know, sort of getting confidence in what we have um, more and more than perhaps we, we have and that, that, that's coming. Um, and, you know, look, the reality is that, you know, as we've discussed already, that the cost of production here in Australia is amongst the highest in the world. So if we're going to support that, that we need to really be creative in how we how we eat on Tuesday night as against how we eat on Saturday night. And so um, if we're going to be a bit more experimental, I, I, that's what I would look forward to is that, you know, the four of us would not have a problem eating sardines, but there's a lot of people that wouldn't eat, it, eat sardines or or lesser, lesser, you know, sort of known, lesser, more fragile species. But as you said, Huck, if, you, if you're buying locally, then the chances are that you're going to have a great experience with that, with something that is a more fragile product. So, uh, so I guess in summary, what I'm looking forward to is probably eating my body weight in uni. For I'm going to be sharing that, so it'll be you'll be eating half your body weight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and looking at some of the other uh, at some of the other really exciting seafoods that we can we can get amongst as well because I mean sustain working sustainability which is has been a bit of a hackneyed cliche in our world over the last sort of ten years or so um, that you know really requires a, a broad view on on how to approach that topic and part of that is is having a sort of a really Catholic view on the choice of seafoods that are consumed not just sticking to centre cut salmon from a sustainable farmer um so you know there's there's there, that i guess in, in i'm really looking forward to the next n- next generation of consumption and and i think that that's going to be a, a far more you know, sort of thought thoroughly thought through process than than just grab and go i'm believe it or not 2024 is going to be more wine in my life more than ever before some exciting announcements coming but uh What I'm looking forward to is kind of getting out amongst the community and talking a bit more about the ebbs and flows of vintages in wine. I think that we have always just jumped on great vintages, but with the way the weather is and climate change, we're all watching the news going, oh, you know, where's flooding, where's burning? So I think it's important to talk about how we support our local farmers in in the trickier vintages and the value that can be seen – on some tough years. I mean, any idiot can make great wine in great vintages, but the trickier ones is where you really see um, 
people's skills and and uh, the way that they handle you know their their vineyards. So I'd like to promote that a little bit more in 2024. Well, I think it's going to be a good year, 2024, and I should um, make mention to thank all of our guests on all of our podcasts for the year. They've been incredible. We've had some cracking guests tell some incredible yarns. And, of of course, our listeners out there that um, tap into every episode and our partners and, of course, you guys, uh, our amazing hosts and uh, the uh, mysterious Rob Locke as well, who's always lurking around in the background, fixing all of our audio and um, doing all amazing things. Um, Have a great Christmas, everyone. And um, we'll catch up soon. Merry Christmas, Wade. Thanks. You too, Hark. Great to catch up with you all. 